Jack Myers, uh, another very influential industry person who's uh, chairman of Myers Biz BizNet, uh, will be moderating our video panel. And it's about how video is transforming our business. A remarkable panel will be discussing and exploring new, model new models of programming, content creation, distribution, and how consumers are finding, consuming, and sharing content. But before we begin, and as they come up, let me introduce you to our panel. Uh, Tara Wolpert-Levy leads the America's agency team of Google and YouTube, driving strategic partnerships that help media, creative, and performance agencies prosper in the digital age. She's also responsible for Google's media specialist sales teams, ranging from the US Hispanic to sponsorships and media programs. Great to have you here, Tara, or soon to have you here, Tara. And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna carry on um, just so we can get straight into the session. Um, Marc de Beauvoir, I've been practicing that for a while, is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of CBS Interactive's Entertainment, News and Sports Division. And in this role, he oversees CBSI's leading sites, including CBS.com, CBSNews.com, and CBSSports.com. De Beauvoir is also uh, responsible for CBI, CBI's uh, digital content distribution strategies and the development of both original and, and show-based digital video content. Glad, glad to have you with us, Mark, too. And then we have Linda Yaccarino, who's the Advertising Sales and Client Partnership Chairman for NBC Universal. In this role, Linda oversees all advertising sales and marketing strategy for the company's entire TV portfolio, including two broadcasts, 17 cable, and more than 50 digital properties. And lastly, we also have Erin McPherson. Erin serves as Chief Content Officer at Maker, driving the brand's programming strategy, overseeing all aspects of original content, series development across platforms, strategic programming partnerships, talent relationships, and editorial content on Maker's proprietary platform, Maker TV. And by the way, Maker is wo the world's largest network of short form online video, bringing together a diverse community of YouTube creators and global franchises as part of the Walt Disney Company. So I'm hoping that they come up now because let's give them a huge round of applause for our all-star panel. So, uh, John did the introduction, so we have Aaron, Linda, Mark, Tara. Uh, let's jump right into it. I'd like each of you, uh, Aaron, if we can start with you, giving us just 60 seconds on the elevator pitch. What is your core value at Maker, and uh, how do you describe your core differentiation? Sure. So, Maker Studios is the world's largest producer and distributor of short-form content online. Just about a year ago, we were acquired by the Walt Disney Company, so we're now part of Walt Disney, and that's a big part of our differentiator. We manage over 55,000 channels. YouTube is our primary distribution partner, but we have our own platform, Maker TV, and we also distribute across a number of other sites and through a number of other players. But we are really the convergence of what I call the best of YouTube, and now the best of Disney. We are driving short form content across all of the Walt Disney Company. So Pixar, Lucas, Marvel, ABC, ESPN. And uh, one of our biggest differentiators is really having a bird's eye view into short form programming, not only across YouTube, but across the internet. Thank you, Linda, NBCU. Linda, NBCU. Um, well, I'd like to say Linda, Comcast, NBCU. So the differentiator for our company really is what we often like to talk about is, uh, you know, the media company designed for the future. So bringing together um, data, content, and distribution all at once, and the ability to create this unparalleled hub a very carefully curated premium video and then distribute it and push it out every single day across every single platform to virtually um, every consumer in the US on a daily basis because of our broad reach and the diversity of our content from two broadcast networks, English, one Spanish, to a broad, broad scale of cable assets from news to sports to entertainment, and then a slew of digital properties, including things like Fandango and E-Online. So um, we also like to say scale lives here. Scale lives here. Good. 
Mark, CBS Interactive. Yeah, CBS and CBS Interactive. Obviously, the uh, largest uh, broadcast television network and uh, one of the largest content producers in the world. Uh, more top 25 and top 50 shows uh, than any other television network. Uh, at CBS Interactive, uh, we're, we're sort of pushing the 150, 180 million people that are watching our television network and leveraging those into online, as well as uh, a number of other brands that we've uh, you know, bought or created over the years to create a formidable uh, interactive company, but we call the largest premium content network uh, on the internet. We're a top 10 overall web property with 270 million uniques globally, about half of those uh, domestic, and uh, you, know, you, know, you know, reaching those people with video and, and, and publishing and content and, and news as well. And so you know, we really think of it as premium content, truly premium content at scale over all platforms. Scale again, Tara. Google and YouTube especially. <laughs> Great. So I won't talk about YouTube's scale, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> YouTube is, though, where I think the world is coming to engage with video today. And we would talk about our differentiators in three ways. One is really delivering your hard to find, most engaged audiences wherever and whenever they're watching. Mm -hmm. And doing that in the, in the second way, which is differentiating, which is in an environment where they are most likely to respond, or in many cases, frankly, even choose to engage with your content. And then lastly, that you know, as many of you know and have taken advantage of, we've invested substantially in a lot of real-time measurement, not just on the impressions delivered, but on basically all of the things that happen between impression and conversion. So brand preferences, brand recall, all of the information that you need to optimize your campaigns, not just on YouTube, but everywhere you're running video. And that, we think, is the third big differentiator of the platform. Cool. So as a senior media director, network buyer at one of the largest agencies said a couple of weeks ago that a video view, a video impression is a video impression regardless of what screen it's on and unstated but inferred in his comment was regardless of the content it's in. Uh, Tara, we have uh, Disney, we have CBS, and we have uh, NBCU, so you're the uh, advocate, do you agree with that, that a video view is a video view, an impression is an impression, and that the screen is irrelevant? So I, I feel like you're, you're setting up that I'm supposed to agree with that, but I actually don't. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think screens and context and content really matter. Um, and that, in fact, we actually tend not to look at views as much anymore. We look at watch time, because it's a much better measure of user engagement, mm -hmm. and what we find is both watch time and, quite frankly, the brand metrics that I was referring to earlier absolutely reflect the value of whether a person has chosen to watch the ad or not, whether they are watching in an environment where they are likely to be more focused on the content or on a screen that, like mobile where they're li more likely to be focused or not. And frankly, and again, I think this may uh, hopefully come as a positive surprise to some of my, my content friends on the panel, but we're big believers that while, yes, of of course, digital enables you to find exactly the right audience, and that is a very powerful thing. On top of that, we still think that content and context matters. And if you look in particular at Google Preferred, which is mm -hmm. our upfront offering that we premiered last year, which basically curates the best content on YouTube, what you can actually see is all things being held equal. The higher the preference score, which is the measure of how popular that content is on the platform, the better the brand results, which says, Content still matters. Con I think we would all agree content still matters. So we're yeah. probably not going to get <laughs> debate on that. Where is there debate? Where, where I, are the... Areas? I'll step out into the breach, although I don't know if there's debate here too, but I'll take a stab at the smaller the screen, the more valuable the view. 70% and upwards of makers traffic, and we oversee 11 billion views a month and growing, are mobile. So 70% of those 11 billion are mobile. And there's that intimate one-on-one -on -one connection that our viewer has with a piece of content. I think this references a little bit of what you were talking about, that um, the viewing experience is different. I mean, communal viewing is still important. You know, the football game on the big screen, or I guess right now, the basketball game yeah. on the big screen. But there's a connection and an intention with a mobile view that you're not getting on a, on a bigger screen. And I throw the screen out the, matters, yeah, and I throw, size matters. Size matters. <laughs> no, and we like to think of it as best screen available, right? And that best screen available may not be the biggest screen in the room, right? It may be what you prefer to do at that moment. And, and the goal is if we can get it, all of the content 
in the right time and the right business model across all of those screens with the right measurement in place, then you know, we as distributors or creators, you know, if we can get to that you know, holy grail, then you know, for marketers, then you can make the decision about where you want to reach that audience, and then hopefully we have the data to tell you when and where to reach that audience. And that best screen available is what matters. You know, for watching the Super Bowl, it's probably a 55-inch big screen. And for watching you know, maybe a, you know, a, a more intimate show that you, really, you, know, you only care about and the rest of the people in your room don't, then maybe it is a smaller, you know, a smaller device. Yep. No. We need Linda's mic on. There are so many or ways to help. shush people. <laughs> 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 Wait, are we back on? No? You can borrow mine? No. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll get, but, but I want to I wanna jump in, actually, because it's nice to all be in agreement on the issue that, that content does matter and that premium content is worth a premium, but there are a lot of people uh, on the procurement side of the business who would disagree with that statement. There are a lot of people charged at the agencies with the responsibility for uh, uh, focusing on impressions and not on content, for using impressions across multiple platforms uh, to drive cost per thousand down. So if we're all agreeing that content matters, how do you argue against the reality of an industry that's fo where, where clients are increasingly pushing their agencies to drive down costs per thousand when you need to all increase your costs per thousand? Linda, I'm gonna let you start with that. You heard I like that <laughs> increase cost per thousand thing. Um, I, well, first of all, I'll get back to the question. I think um, screen is second to content because the screen that matters most is driven by the interest of the consumer to watch the content that's on it. So the best screen available, it depends what they're choosing to watch. And I think it's a really, really big differentiator which feeds into your question about whether it's driving CPM. Uh, you know, the content makers don't, don't charge a price. The market finds that its level and determines value. Okay, and what feeds into that value is the quality of your content and investment. And I think that that's what's driving the marketplace there. You can't ignore the um, pressure for procurement, but you have, a, a, and to drive um, efficiencies, but you really need to be careful and not forget about the efficacy of the impact on the consumer or the ability to compel a consumer to act. And when you're able to take the marriage of that video content with a piece of our, many of your pieces of video content in this room, and that's where the magic happens in terms of uh, combining uh, the context in which they're seen. And that's where, you know, the premium will come, but the market determines that value. And the, the scarcity is such today to get that premium content at scale, and I think that's where the conversation goes. And I'd throw in that it's not just the, the premium, I agree completely, it's about can you deliver that reach and then can that advertiser see the return on the other side, right? And you know, we're not all trading on return metrics because there isn't necessarily a great way to do that in every medium, but I think we're getting closer. Certainly the digital extension of, of the premium content that the networks are creating is enabling us to see a lot more data than we did before enable us to maybe show that what that return might be for those, those advertisers. But so Linda, Linda said something about the market being driven by investment in the content and that, and by the way, I think I agree content and screen, to me content and screen are actually inextricably twined. We make content that's specifically intended to be mobile. There's other content that's intended to be large screen. But I do think that the market is still pricing a lot of content based on investment in the content as opposed to engagement by the audience. I, we represent some of the world's biggest YouTubers who engage their audience as much as or more than premium broadcast television, yet to your point, it's a race to the bottom still in some ways on the ad side and that's, that's a disparity. It's actually a, a great point that, that you can pick up on Linda, you said the, the market drives pricing, and yes, that's true, but that, that puts us into a traditional supply-demand model where demand exceeded or equal supply. Now we're in an over, increasingly oversupplied marketplace, yeah. and I'm wondering if procurement and the drive to the bottom that you talk about is driving pricing rather than your traditional models 
that, that you've operated under for 50 years in the network television business. If, if the fundamental core business models are shifting, and if they are, how you're responding to that in your business models at, at YouTube and how you sell and how you price. Well, I, you know, honestly, I think we see the market bifurcating. Um, that there is a, I don't love the word premium because to your point, that has a connotation that I think is different than what we mean, but there is a certain amount of content that either gets a certain amount of unduplicated reach or drives an unparalleled amount of engagement that is worth more than some of the other impressions that are out there, right? And I think you guys sell out in the upfront. Last year, we sold out in the upfront. I think some of those dynamics for that type of content will continue. But what you see growing next to it is an ever bigger adjacent model of what's available across the rest of the content, whether that is long tail cable or internet or anything else. And there you see a lot more incorporation of the auction and programmatic buying and folks who are really aiming at a different thing, right? They are aiming at simply straight up efficient reach, not necessarily the most effective or unique mm -hmm. or uh, associated with the greatest content or content makers uh, approach, which is still incredibly important. And I think we're actually gonna see both of those models persist. The question is just what's the balance. Right, and there's a value exchange for that. You have the, the, the marketer or the agency makes a decision if it's that you know kind of race to the bottom, there, there's a value exchange in what environment your advertisements are gonna be. But in terms of the value of the content and value for your widely distributed content on YouTube is extremely valuable to a particular type of consumer. Right. And there are obviously different ROI metrics for mm -hmm. other uh, you know, consumers or other um, metrics that you're trying to reach for a particular brand. Well, Tim earlier said that he felt it was 100% sure that the television networks, broadcast and cable, would move in aggressively into programmatic. I, I'm, I'm adding the word aggressively, but I think he inferred that in his comment. Uh, do you agree that the television networks will? I, I think some television networks will. Um, Tim was kind enough to offer um, for NBC Universal to participate at his programmatic upfront a couple of months ago, I guess it was. And as most of you know in this room, NBC Universal has been extremely um, aggressive in this space. I think maybe it was John that said that, you know, it's kind of here to stay or programmatic is, is uh, John Montgomery uh, is, is a part of our future. So again, we look at programmatic, um, I think you have to define it, whether it's back office automation, whether it's just this data-driven real-time buying, or there's also NBC Universal has a programmatic tool that's for premium content, that it wouldn't be in the real-time, you know, kind of bidding space. So I think it's, um, a seat at the table type of strategy. Mm -hmm. we, we fund or fuel our programmatic tools with all of our display inventory and a good bit of our video that's increasing over time. So we're not afraid of the P word. And I think um, most television networks will begin to see that it's something they need to participate So you're not afraid in. of the programmatic P word. What about the procurement P word? Well, I'm always afraid of that because I think sometimes procurement um, doesn't um, listen or look to the soft side that needs to be addressed and look at um, the, the almost the marketing goals of when you marry the, the power of the content and assess value versus this, you know, kind of David data driven metrics that'll just give you a number on a spreadsheet. And I think you have to look at whether it's, you know, we see a tremendous amount of success at our company with something we call Symphony. So it's the activation and um, mobilization of all of our assets across the company to, to um, partner with advertisers in a marketing campaign okay. to deliver metrics. And, and that you can't talk to a procurement. To talk procurement to. Yeah, and the one thing I throw in programmatic is like, it's a very loaded word because it means a lot of things to different people. So I think if you start talking about real-time bidding on television advertising, I think we're a very we're farther away from that than we are closer to it. I think the idea of, of sort of automating certain parts of the buying uh, infrastructure and layering it with data, I think we're getting closer and closer. I think that's the part that's going to grow in a meaningful way because it's going to be percentage points, you know, low percentage mm -hmm. points on a huge, huge business. And, and I think that's going to be really big impact over the next few years. And the way we think about it is, you know, can you layer in that, that automation or that, that ease of, of buy 
with the, the first party data that you have as an advertiser or an agency uh, and the data that we have uh, on our users and, and coming with something like you know, 150, 130 million people domestically on the internet that are layered against our TV audience and how do we match all that data up to, to have better insight as to what to buy. And if you as an advertiser, you know, this isn't the way it is today. You don't let us just move around ads the way we feel like because there's this, you know, I don't know if it's trust or distrust of like where we're going to put it to try to yield optimize. But if, the, if we can get to that point where we trust to say, look, we're just trying to deliver you a result, you know, get you that reach and get you that return, can we, can we do that in a way that is semi-automated with data? I mean, that is a win for everybody, right? So I think we're, we're not there this year. We're, you know, we're starting to get there. We're trying to have those conversations. Can we get there in a few years? Good. I hope Sarah? so. You want all right, you said earlier bifurcation. You've all talked in one context or another about uh, effectiveness. So you've got this, this efficiency drive on, on one end, driven by automation, programmatic to a certain extent. And then you've got the, the qualitative components of value and how you deliver ROI. And there's uh, mo many of the, the networks and digital companies are out with a, a, a wide diversity of measures of performance, uh, data, better data on content. Linda, I know you've been doing a lot of work. CBS announced an initiative, uh, uh, Dave Poltrak, a couple weeks ago. Uh, YouTube is, is talking a lot about proving effectiveness. You talked about the engagement that your, um, that your, your stars, the, the YouTube stars have with their audiences. But I've been talking to a lot of planners, buyers, and clients, clients over the last several months, and they're concerned about the lack of standardization in the metrics. Uh, and the estimate is that it might impact 2% of this year's upfront. And long term, even if we look out to 2020, maybe 10 to 15% of the uh, of video buying on performance-based metrics. You're putting huge amounts of investment and dependence on being able to prove the effectiveness and the performance against the consumer, against the audience, but yet the vast majority of the buying still seems to be on the efficiency side of your bifurcation. So how do, you, how do you deal with that from the seller's perspective? And how do you convince clients and agencies to move more to performance-based metrics if that's what you're depending on for your future? Well, if I, we think about that in two ways. I mean, one is new platforms are always held to a higher standard than the ones that exist, right? And I think it was John who said earlier that people are comfortable with TV. Uh, that same comfort doesn't always exist when buyers come in and look at online video platforms, and so they ask for more proof. And, and we think of that as table stakes, to your point, mm -hmm. right? It's not necessarily going to be the ongoing differentiator, but I will tell you the difference between last year when we walked in the door with Google Preferred, which was a concept and evidence of consumer movement and, and engagement, but not evidence of advertiser performance because we'd never done it before. The difference between that conversation and this year's conversation where we can prove that we had tremendous results for brands and their agencies in that offering last year on 80% you know, lift on ad recall, 17% lift on uh, brand preference, things like that. Those are conversation changers. So I think the onus ends up being on us to get to the table by doing some of that. There's a second piece, though, which is part of the reason that we invest in the real-time metrics and are trying to offer all of these capabilities that never existed before to look at what happens between impression and conversion is because we actually think it's good not only for the client and for the user, but for our industry and, frankly, a huge opportunity for agencies, right? Because that allows so much of the insights that everyone in this room gathers and so much of the knowledge about how to work with research and optimization and creative in a way mm -hmm. that nobody else does. That is part of, that's, that's what I heard as part of Tim's view of the future. And you know, our, our hope is that in helping to enable that, that's something that sort of is a win for everybody. Erin, do you want Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree, Jack, that the industry could take steps forward in standardization, that it is a complicated landscape. However, there is some need for complication, and maybe this is where agencies step in and actually help solve, along with platforms. The example I like to use is, of course, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg saying, we drive 3 billion video views a day. I mean, they're going to be a major, major force in the marketplace. But they count a video view after three seconds, autoplay, no sound. Vine drives 1.5 billion loops a day, 
but for Vine, a loop is actually six seconds with sound. So we're in a world where it's not apples to apples, it's apples to like kumquats. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> not, and it's in a way that's, a, that's an opportunity. Although, is it holding all those dollars at bay for what is simple, nobody gets fired for buying TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is people, that's a, that's a metric we've all learned to live with and understand. That's, that's because those video views are half hours to an hour with, de with deep engagement as well. well right? So they're, they're comparing a six second video and a you know, 45 it, minute video session. And I think that's where uh, that breaks down, right? It's well, that, but our, our session And we believe in short form too, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's all got places, right? I mean, it's a, a, it, at all. It does, and of course, a diversified approach is best. And exactly. this, maybe this is where we can help help out actually with the agencies and the, mm -hmm. and the clients. At Maker, I know we have an initiative called Maker Labs where we are using data across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube to actually help inform not just buying but content creation on the front end. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Linda. Well, I don't think it's about life or death, fired or not fired, TV versus digital. I think it, it um, from what Tim was saying, I agree with him that there'll be a kind of a thinning, thinning out or a coming together and um, uh, of, of what I would say the haves or the have nots. So that being said, to your question, um, Jack, about uh, a, a confidence or, or, or the um, currency or one kind of metric, uh, we're actually finding while, I'm surprised at your statistic that buyers, it's not gonna impact, because what we're finding is a lot of support from our advertisers and agencies in our new um, data tools or our push to really be aggressive beyond the limitations of Nielsen. So I thought you were gonna ask me a question about the measured GRPs in the market because I think everyone in the room is as um, equally as there might be some anxiety about new metrics or new, new standards or, mm -hmm. or opportunities in digital, there is a tremendous frustration in the TV community with the limitations of Nielsen. And as we know over the years that we've all worked together, that um, measurement really has never kept up and has lagged behind consumer behavior. Now it's more dramatic than ever. So we find a lot of support in the advertiser community for, for our data tools that go way beyond age and gender delineation and we go more towards behavioral psychographic guarantees. Yeah, but I would say that, that one of the opportunities, I mean, I think for folks in this room is probably recognizing that gap in measurement and, and you know, we find, and you probably find this as well, it's like it's, sometimes it's very hard to sell something that's not even the basic demographic measurement. You look at an OTT platform like Roku or Apple TV, there's no demographic measurement yet, probably coming later this year. Uh, you look at VOD, uh, unless we were owned by Comcast, we probably don't have the set-top box data uh, to be able to leverage into those VOD buys, so you can't really get all that specific data. But if you're an advertiser, and you can recognize that there's this gap, you probably have this period of time where there's a, there's a price benefit to going after these sort of persons two plus platforms, but you kind of know, you can do some research and figure out who's there mm -hmm. and probably get a benefit by not having to sort of pay for that targeting. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you're gonna get it because those platforms are delivering big right now. They're delivering big for us against the programming and, and they're it, delivering wide. It's also influencing audience. how we're launching content today. So if you look at a couple of programs at NBC Universal, we're launching simultaneously linear platforms on our digital platforms, which would be our FEP and Hulu, but also in VOD space simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of metrics or, or guarantee tools that we have to use, and it's not just one. So that doesn't exist in a C3 currency. So we have 30 minutes and we have only a minute <laughs> left, and I was asked to stay on the clock. Unfortunately, we haven't really been able to drill down into any of these topics. I tried to cover a lot of different topics that are relevant, but I'd like to close with some less relevant but comments. Uh, just uh, a program or video that, uh, that's on your site or network that you would recommend everyone watch very quickly. Just uh, a program. Uh, epic Rap Battles. Epic Rap, epic rap battles, battles of History. If you haven't seen it, your kids have. Got it. They're yeah. really good. Near impossible to pick one, but I'll go with uh, Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Great one. Uh, I can't say the Late Show with Stephen Colbert yet, but uh, how about Madam Secretary? I think it's great. <laughs> I love it. Also Agreed. really good. I'm such a huge video consumer. Um, you know what? I would say more people are watching News on Vice than Anderson Cooper. If you're not one of them, you should be. Cool. All right. Uh, a business book, any business book you'd recommend that you think our audience should be reading? Oh, wow. Uh, I'm reading Creativity, Inc., 
now that, now that I'm a cast member and part of Disney, I actually never did read Creativity Inc., right, mm -hmm. by Ed Catmull, the president of Pixar. So um, I guess I'm not in a place to recommend it yet. But <laughs> uh, not so sure specific to business, but certainly help us all. Medici effect, Rans Johansson, and the impact of uh, diversity on innovation. Cool. Uh, I haven't been reading a ton of business books lately, but I was been discussing one with my brother, who's one of the founders of uh, two big YouTube channels in Machinima and, and Style Hall, uh, exponential organization. Sort of how to change your organization from a linear org to an exponential org. Interesting stuff. Cool. I just finished Rookie Smarts, which is basically about approaching business from a learning versus knowing mindset. Cool. And I thought it was great. Okay. And last question: uh, non-network video company that you think represents the greatest long-term threat to the television network business. <laughs> non-network TV company that represents the greatest threat to the TV network company. television business. I'll make it easy. It's, uh, it's YouTube, but I think of them as a partner. They're a partner as well. If they wanted to be in the content business, they have the billions to have spent yeah. the same billions we all spend on content. They didn't do it. They did it a different way. They yeah. went after being a distributor, really. And I think that's, yeah. so therefore, I don't think of it as pure threat. We're a partner. Yeah. We sell advertising yeah. on YouTube. So they're the most... Interesting in that. That's a tough and one. Just building on that, because we would totally agree. Like, you can't take <laughs> network off the table. I think it's entirely in the hands of the networks. They've got incredible platforms, incredible content. It'll be a question of what. Well, that, that would lead us to the Tim, who's running fastest away from the bear. <laughs> but did you want to add a? Yeah, that's a tough one because everybody's making amazing content. I mean, this really is the golden age uh, across every network. There are amazing <laughs> programs. Netflix is, I think, okay. I mean, but I don't think Netflix, I, I don't want to put words in my own mouth. Netflix isn't going to kill, you know, television, but it's making great content. Um, I think you have to think about it in terms, it's a little bit of a hostile question, Jack. I know. But um, I think you have to think in terms of what it becomes, because there's going to be a lot of partnerships that emerge. I would agree with a Netflix and the SFOD, really got to uh, keep an eye on that in terms of the fueling the entire ecosystem really important, but I think you really gotta, you know, we like to watch and take a look and see what okay. Apple does, so. Mm. And I look at Amazon and think that mm. that's a, uh, what they're doing and what they have in the way of yeah. data and content and distribution is really an interesting company to keep our eye on and uh, yes. pay attention to. Aaron, Linda, Mark. Uh, yep, we're closing. We're Aaron, Linda, Mark, Tara, <laughs> thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very, very much.